Good morning. Nice of you guys to drop by. What a piece of junk. What are you talking about? Don't be too proud of this technological peril you've constructed. Look, don't worry. Everything's going to be fine. Trust me. I don't know what all this trouble is about, but I'm sure it must be your fault. Oh. Don't get technical with me. This bickering is pointless. Don't everybody thank me at once. I don't know where you get your delusions, laser brain. I'm glad you're here to tell us these things. How could you even say that? I got a bad feeling about this. Well, come on. Everything's perfectly all right now. We're fine. We're all fine here now. Thank you. How are you? <laughs> Would you get going, you pirate? Get in there, you big furry oaf! I don't care what you smell! I'm getting too old for this sort of thing. If what you've told me is true, you will have gained my trust. I like the sound of that. Get a shuttle ready. I don't know. Fly casual. Shuttle to Dirian. What is your cargo and destination? Transmission commencing. Boop, boop, boop. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in once again to the Shuttle to Dirian podcast. I am your pilot, Jim Chadwick, also known as Hey Chadwick on the forums. I do have sitting next to me Phil Mead. My co-pilot, Phil, how's it going? It's going well. Uh, everything is, is uh, operating at peak efficiency today. We've uh, gone through some recent uh, additional Ewok purges, uh, but I think the the new crew is uh, getting uh, getting their uh, you know Ewok business together. They, the new surviving crew. Correct. Yes. <laughs> this this only the strong survive. Yeah, <laughs> or the clever, but not too clever. Um, right. We also have our uh, head of human resources, uh, Jaybot. How you doing, Jaybot? Uh, I'm doing pretty good. I'm just waiting for our uh, new death squad trials to complete, and then uh, we could uh, find some new members, or you know, get rid of some and find some new recruits. Hopefully, you never know. These are you know, an ongoing flux. It's a lot of turnover in this uh, in that division. <laughs> if we um, if the uh, the course wasn't so rigorous and had such a huge uh, turnover rate. We might um, we might have like an elite commando team on our hands, like a, a whole you know company of elite death squad Ewoks. But I think the uh, the trials and tribulations to graduate is a little too uh, too severe for most. Well, but that's what have, makes them gotta so have good. standards. Gotta have yeah. standards. That's right. If we start letting in some that aren't quite up to snuff, then where does a slippery slope lead? You know, next thing you know, anybody that kills a stormtrooper with a rock gets in. And we just can't have that <laughs> because it is frightfully too easy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you don't know, have to say that now that we're recording on, on the mornings. That our level of enthusiasm kicking off is taken down a little bit of a notch. So, so maybe it's actually good that we have a bit of a jazz intro so we can be all mellow <laughs> once it starts. But. Um, all right, so I have a captain's question, um, and I've been playing uh, the little app, Star Wars Force Arena, where you get little guys running around and shoot each other, you get play against real people, and I got a little upgrade, um, and inspired me for the captain's question, because I got Zuckus as a backup, or Dengar. Um, and basically, is who is your favorite bounty hunter? So out of all the movies, you know, extended universe, all that, whatever, who is your favorite bounty hunter? And uh, Phil, I'll go to you. Um, <clears throat> I think that uh, the Zuckus and Forlom probably are uh, my my favorites. Uh, I like the, I like to imagine like they have a you know um, funny uh, rapport between them, like a like a almost like a good cop bad cop, or like a lethal weapon type. Uh, like buddy cop movie. Buddy, sort it's of a, thing. they're a buddy cop. They're a buddy bounty hunter movie waiting to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they've got to have some witty banner between them because. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but it's probably in a language we don't even know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just pulling up pictures of them because Penawas has actually looked at them. They're really weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Zuckus looks like he's got a. a a bar, a Browning automatic rifle that's been <laughs> modified to make it look like a yeah. All space those, gun. all those Star Wars guns, man. They're all. It's funny how oh. they they always modify uh, 
real real world guns. Uh, sometimes just a just a little bit, and then yeah. give them to these guys. Yeah, we probably had so many World War Two props laying around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they probably yeah. Uh, had so much equipment they weren't even props. There's just so much stuff that was left lying around out there. It was easy to get a hold of. <laughs> Went to the dump. Oh, let's grab a couple of these. All right. A little bit of, you get a little bit of that with the uh, newer movies, too, like Rogue One. Um, Cassian Andor's gun is uh, built off a M16 uh, receiver. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, even the I'll pistol. Take a look at it. Yeah, the pistol is like the... Uh, I think it would be the receiver. Uh of the uh, of an M16 or a... yeah, I I see that. That's pretty cool. I never noticed that. Huh. I've only seen Rogue One once though, and I feel like I've only like seen a lot of previews or something. <laughs> I just feel like it's not complete. Like I haven't quite seen it enough. But at this point, it's been a month. I don't know if I can get anybody to go back to the theater with me. But uh, yeah, I want to see it more. Only once. How many times have you guys seen Rogue One? Uh, I've seen it twice. Yeah, just the one time. I rarely see very many movies in the theater more than once. I think I can count those on like one hand, less than one hand, really, that I've ever done that to. Yeah, I think the last movie I saw that way was Episode Seven, but I think the Star Wars ones are are worth it. Dread. That was the last one I've seen twice in the movie theater. Had half a mind to go back and see it a third time. What was it? But Dread. The I don't newer even one. Know that one. Uh, no, not Dread. With- and that was Sylvester Stallone, right? Yeah, the, not Judge Dredd, just Dredd. So, Carl, um, Carl Urban, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is a very, very, very good movie. I'm very, very, very disappointed they never made a sequel to. But uh, here's hoping one day Hollywood will get its head out of its collective butt and actually make a good movie. Dredd 2009, three college students set up to document what the other Dredd the most. <laughs> no. Is that it? <laughs> that does not sound like it. <laughs> no. <laughs> I guess it's Judge Dredd or something like that, or one of those Dredd-type movies. Yeah, well, D-R-E-D-D, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's got two Ds. You probably spelled it wrong. Oh, of course. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, moving on. J-Bot, who is your favorite uh, bounty hunter? Uh, well, I could go – obviously, there's a million different options – I could go completely off kilter, which is my standard way of doing things, um, or I could go with the classic or one that I've recently thought would been would have been hilarious had they played it this way. Um, but uh, my favorite, obviously, is is Boba. Without knowing really in the movies, you don't really know too much about them. Um, at least the originals, you don't really know too much about them. Um, I'm really hoping that come the Hollow uh, Han Solo movie that they give him a lot more screen time, a lot more kind of uh, uh, time to show him, him being, I guess, the the character that the expanded universe has, has kind of all uh, made him out to be. Um, and not sucking. It, yeah. Um, historically, <laughs> obviously, as a KOTOR fan, um, I was always a fan of Kalo Nord, who is a uh, – he makes a relatively brief appearance in the game, um, but – He's just kind of this nameless, everybody's afraid of him sort of bounty hunter, um, and no one can talk to him. So like the first time you see him in the game, he's sitting in a cantina, like a group of people come up to him like, hey, aren't you Kalo Nord? And he just says, one. And like, no, 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 we're just trying to figure out two. <laughs> and then if he ever gets to three, <laughs> he basically guns you down. Um, and uh, so the first time you talk to him, he starts that too. Um, you eventually obviously get to to fight him later on in the game when you have an actual chance of defeating him. Uh, but recently, um, I think what, what ran me onto it, uh, most people listening to this are probably familiar, or at least vaguely familiar with Robot Chicken, um, is Greedo. <laughs> and <laughs> this, stick with me here. Um, the idea of, you know, essentially having a bounty hunter going through that cantina, um, knowing how many bad people, in a sense, uh, you get the idea that there's all these people, I think it was Robot Chicken that did this where, where, you know, they're essentially walking through the cantina. He's like, he's got the death mark on 11 systems. or And uh, Greedo's like, hey, that's right. And he walks over to him and like, guns him down. It's like, <laughs> yeah. it's like, forget Han Solo. This guy's got a death sentence in 11 systems. He's worth a fortune. <laughs> um, I'm like, man, that, how much better would Star Wars have been if that's what it was? Like, they're sitting there at the table and he's like, what did that guy just say? <laughs> okay, you're, you're free to go, Han. I'm going to go take care of this this problem because he's 
he's had his arm lopped off and uh he's yeah, right. not really got a chance to defend himself <laughs> <laughs> and to me, I'm like that would have been the perfect kind of Greedo character. Like, I'm not going to try and go after this guy who's got a gun on his hip. I'm going after the guy over there who's missing an arm and, <laughs> right. and worth a fortune. So, um, so I know I stole three, but uh, Boba seems like the too easy of an answer because um, he's he would probably be most people's in in general. Yeah, um, yeah, I think it's good. And actually, I haven't seen all of the Star Wars robot chickens. So, I mean, just so many of them. Oh, they're, they're, yeah. they're yeah. so yeah. hilarious. They're I so hilarious. See Look them up. Yeah, I've just go on of, YouTube and spend an hour or two basically watching <laughs> Robot Chickens from the, uh, was it Gary the Stormtrooper um, up through uh, Emperor Palpatine, essentially ordering lunch <laughs> with the people, just working as a generic guy in an office ordering lunch uh, with the office mates. Yeah, yeah. Um, I haven't seen a lot of them. Uh, you know, Jar Jar Binks Force Ghost. Annie, now I'm all sparkly. Now we can play forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's one of my favorite. Um, but all right, so I think for, for me, my favorite is Dengar. Um, I, I'm not even quite sure why. At first, he was just kind of there with a the, you know with a gun. I started to and they started to come out with the Jump Master. They they talked about it, and I started to look up on Dengar, and I was like, you know what? And I, I read the Bounty Hunter Wars, and the Bounty Hunter Wars, he's a he's a wimp. He's, I don't know, he's just like some schmuck who happens to team up with Boba Fett for some reason. You know, like he saves Boba Fett's life, therefore Boba Fett doesn't kill him and treats him as an equal. And he does nothing the rest of the game. <laughs> it's just about the narrator to us, Boba Fett does cool things. And um, he was so bad, I was like, I, you know what, I'm just going to I'm gonna ignore that and I hate it. Uh, and I'm going to look at the cool stuff for Dengar and he's in the Clone Wars and he loves to blow things up and I'm like actually all right he's kind of cool I like him so he's got the big gun and he blows things up he's a little insane um he's all messed up because of Han Solo cheated so yeah I like Dengar and he and makes, a, about makes a bold Dengar. fashion choice yes with the yeah toy. that's the I could <laughs> never get past that. that that was always a kid i'm well, like he, i don't went, understand a, this according character. to robot chicken he went with the uh toilet theme in bounty hunter school right, <laughs> right. toilet paper hat and the uh toilet seat chip yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. and that yeah, was... i could never get past the look of the character it was one of those when, when they kind of come across the screen you're like who is that goof it's like they ran out of ideas in the costume department and just said here, throw this towel around your head, and and we'll make it work. <laughs> but I like him in like robot in not robot in um the Clone Wars. They do they make him kind of neat. I like him. But uh, yeah, so so I just kind of decided to like Dengar because half of his stuff is stupid, and I ignore it. And I'm only focusing on the good. I decided, you know what? He's so crappy. I'm gonna like him. Uh, and then when when they were he was coming out, everyone thought Dengar was gonna be terrible. Oh, it's so stupid, such a bad ship. Everybody panned it. You know, when they learned about Dengar's ability and all, it's like, I'm going to like Dengar. I'm going to try to fly him. I think I'm, I think he's going to be good. I'm going to see how, how good he is. And, of course, now he's Dengaru and amazing and breaking X-Wing, blah, blah, blah. But So get get this is funny. I, I went to Google to just uh, Google the picture of Dengar, and the fir- the second thing that comes up after you type <laughs> Dengar is, no, is Dengaru. Like how how bad is that 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 the number two thing on there is is Dangaroo? That's just that should show you like how sad it is that uh, that that list has become so yeah I guess such a in a sense almost a Star Wars X Wing meme now it's just everywhere. Yeah. Yep. It is kind of crazy, but uh, yeah. So Dengar is is my favorite bounty hunter. I just like him. He got he's got the. Uh, the German machine gun, you know, Hitler's buzzsaw so it turned into a uh, space gun. So that's pretty cool, too. Yeah. All right. So um, one thing I know, Jay, you've been overstressed with a lot of the, this, this um, HR business with the Ewoks. And I'm, I'm I just want to run some diagnosis to make sure you're OK. Are you feeling all right? Yeah, I'm feeling fine. All right. Let me just fiddle with it. Oh. Crap, I just Phil, you got a spare restraining uh, bolt? Uh hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh Phil J Bod, J Bod. I have to go it's, see it's Jake okay. in, the, in the hold. I'll be right back. It's okay. What 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 it's don't. okay. I'm fine. I'm fine. There's nothing wrong. Just tell we him don't to, need... to just relax. Put the <laughs> wrench down. No. You 
will go to the Dego bus. But I was going into Toshi Station to pick up some power converters. Blue, go to the Dego bus. It just isn't fair. No, I don't even know what I'm doing here. We're wasting our time. Your inside serves you well. <laughs> so, so I have a bit of a bit of a concern of late that I've run into. Um, and I guess this would be what some would kind of term a first world problem um, that I've started to run into in, in the I game. I think our whole podcast is about first world problems. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe that's our second tagline. <laughs> Shuttle Tiberium, we complain about first world problems. Um, but when I was growing up, I know I seem to go back, back to the old days um, every single time I, I do one of these complaints, but when I was growing up, um, we had one gaming store for three cities. We, uh, I don't know how many people here, probably not very many know the, the area, but in Greensboro, North Carolina, we had a place called Cosmic Castle. And they were your kind of classic gaming store, which is in a strip mall, you know, like a 30 feet wide at the most and 100 feet deep. It was a really, really small store. And they crammed everything gaming related into it. So your D and D, your Warhammer, um, the handful of board games that existed in those days, um, that sort of thing was all crammed into this store, mm-hmm. and it fed a, in this area three cities. So you had to kind of drive from forty five minutes away if if you were on the outskirts of it, um, and it eventually closed and and was essentially the only real gaming store in the area that closed. So fast forward 15 years. I actually remember when it closed. I remember driving by the weekend it was closing. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, and the woman that ran it retired. That, that If that gives you an idea of how long this store ran, that she kept the store going, um, it was just kind of this icon in the area. Well, fast forward 15 years. Um, through college, there were no real stores anywhere around Charlotte. That's where I went to school. Um, and now... I look around the kind of gaming store landscape and it's oversaturated. That, that's my opinion. And it it's, it's almost become oversaturated. And yeah. I've, I've mentioned this before on some of the, uh, I want to say I've mentioned it before in some of the earlier podcasts, but we now have two gaming stores that are across the street from each other. They're, <laughs> they're no more than like 200 yards away from each other. And they're both really good stores. So I I don't even know. We we got a guy who in the area who kind of coordinates a lot of the the X wing nights and stuff like that named Blake, and he probably has a better idea of how many stores are around in the area, around in the Charlotte area. Um, so I'm just going to hazard a guess. There's like eight or nine stores um, that can feature or will feature um, X wing. Yeah, there's at least seven. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So and another one opened up relatively close to you i think on the uh on that side of of the city so we essentially have a a huge player base in this area in the in the charlotte kind of surrounding area and that's great but every time a store opens it splits this these groups of people and they start to scatter more and more so there was a time our local store had you know three or four of us when we first kind of started and then it grew and expanded and we, we'd have 15 or 20 people in that store taking over essentially the whole back half of the store. I remember our record was, I think, 14 tables. Yeah, 14 tables. I mean, so <laughs> it was it was insane how much how many people we had at the store. And at that point, it was almost too much in one store. Now we're I mean, we have some new people that are starting to come into into our local store, the one Jim and I play in. Um, but without those local people, we'd be down to four four or five every week because every night of the week, every single night of the week, you've got another store running an X wing night. And that's and, great and, for the game. I don't and like the traffic and people living on yeah. different sides of town. Right. And like right. traffic gets pretty crazy at times with yeah. you know, and, construction and highways. And, mm-hmm. and, and I don't so much complain about that. I, I like that everybody has something as an option close to them. But what really is starting to bug me is not being a tournament fan, every one of these stores is having a tournament, either every Saturday, every Sunday, every second Saturday. So where it used to be, oh, there's a regional or there's a store championship and people are trying to train and practice for that. Now it's every weekend there's a tournament somewhere. And some of them have 
leagues opening up. So now people have to go to a certain store to play in a league game. And the league game is, is essentially a long form tournament. And, and so you've got all these players who are getting further and further away from the casual game. They just want to practice with these big lists. They just want to practice with their tournament lists the entire time. They have almost no interest in anything outside of it. So we set up Mario Kart in our store and it's cool and we have fun and they'll play their tournament behind us and come over and look at it. And then they'll walk away because it's not tournament related. It's not they gotta practice. They got to practice. They, yeah, they got to practice. And, and there is a point at which practice doesn't help you anymore. And I don't know how well, exactly what the turn of phrase is for people, but you know, if you're practicing bad habits, you're just practicing to be bad. You know? So what <laughs> I, what I was basically complaining about in the store the other day is because of the tournament scene, because of the card, so much of it has to do with the ship and the card that I think the piloting skill ability of players and the player base is dropping where in the old days where it was a lot of jousting and you had um, arc dodgers in general and the turreted ships were just kind of there, people had to learn how to pilot their ships. They had to learn how to fly around and make the best of a single arc. Now we've got all these ships with multiple arcs and people are forgetting how to fly. So when I put people on a Mario Kart table, they're all over it. They're hitting walls and they're like, oh, I can't fly the ship. And, and somehow Jim and I, who aren't tournament seasoned anymore, are zipping around, not touching a wall, turning corners, <laughs> and we shouldn't be these expert pilots. And, and people are like, oh, these, these turns are too tight. I'm like, how are they too tight? Because you don't have a barrel roll, a boost, and, and all sorts of repositioning because you're stuck in a headhunter. They're not tight. You just yeah. lost the ability to fly a ship as well as you used to be. And that has the most mediocre dial. I mean, it has. Right. It doesn't have a bad dial, but it doesn't have a good dial. It's just yeah. like the most average generic dial. And I, I feel like what's happened because of this glut of stores, because of this glut of nights, and and because of this kind of glut and over, over, I don't even know uh, what the word is, but way too many tournaments, people are getting away from how to fly precisely with their ships. So much repositioning is available, or I don't mind if I bump into a bunch of stuff because that's the point of my ship. And if you notice, there's a theme starting to come out where lots of characters and things are actually wanting to get in your way and bump you. Um, I think people are starting to lose the ability to turn their ships three turns ahead to know, like, I need to be in this position in three turns in order to to basically gun somebody down and, or be in that perfect spot assuming they don't do something very strange with the ship. And and that kind of saddens me because the game is losing, for me, the heart of what it is, which is the ability to pilot. And I feel like half of me wants to go to Gen Con with this Mario Kart thing and just put it on the table and say, each person takes one ship, there's not going to be any other ships on here, and whoever finishes the lap in the least amount of turns wins. Because I have a feeling you're going to run into a ton of people who can't do it who can't go on a blank map and, and fly a ship around without touching walls. And that saddens me because you're losing the heart of the game, in my opinion. And, and it's because, and, and from what I see, it's because cards are allowing them to do that. There, there's so much, you know, oh, this will adjust your dice so you don't really need to get into a good firing position. Or you've got a turret, or you've got this guy who just bumps into you and does damage to you. I, I guess I get it. I mean, I know you have to continue to expand the game, but um, I hate to see the soul of the game kind of lost in this expansion. And, and that's really what's uh, what this whole complaint's about. It's great to have lots of stores, although I, stu I still do think we have too many stores, <laughs> you know, when you've got two across the street yeah. from each other. Um, but at the same time, it's great to have those options. Uh, and it's great that the stores are... are bigger and lots more players and they're dragging in more players and that sort of thing. But I feel like all they're doing is dragging in players to a tournament scene and then brand new players are learning how to play for tournaments, not for this uh, kind of piloting ability. Um, and yeah. I've said, and I said that when, when, when we have new people and they ask me like, Oh, I just, I can't get used to the turns. I can't get used to like how sharp the turns are, how far they go. And I've always said from, from the early days, this is what I did. I, I took a handful of pennies and just tossed them across my dining room table. And then for an hour, basically flew my ships around them with the goal of not touching the pennies. 
And because of that, I got really, really good at judging the distances, you know, on your turns and, and everything. And yeah, I don't think people do this anymore. I think they just take ships out of the box, throw them on the table and then just try and learn the turns and try and learn the, the arcs and that sort of stuff from, uh, from I can tell you from, in the middle of a tournament or in the middle of training for a tournament. And I think that's why the skill is starting to fall out of the game for Mario Kart. You don't want to do that three bank. Most of the time you end up wanting to do a two bank because a three bank will over will go take you too far and pointing the wrong direction. And a two bank is going to be much better for you. And that's, that's hard for a lot of people. I, I kept making that mistake, but I quickly corrected because I realized that a two bank is much better than a three bank a lot of times. Yeah. And, and, uh, I know I'm a hark on the Mario Kart stuff because I do love it. The the newest map that I posted to the Facebook page, um, it's it's actually deceptive from the angle that I took the picture. But um, essentially, the opening stretch and the first corner are all four bases wide, so four small bases wide. And then once you turn kind of the horseshoe, it all starts to tighten in to three bases wide. And all the way through the kind of long uh, loops back and forth, it's all three bases wide. But then the final back stretch of the game is only two and a half bases wide. It's this isn't designed for for large base ships, obviously. Yeah. But it's two and a half bases wide. So the idea here is you can't fly in straight lines down the back stretch. You're going to have to actually wiggle yourself around um, through the final kind of chicane. And when I see people all over the walls in that four base wide section, it, it actually, I'm like, man, these, these people are never going to make it through that, that two and a half base wide section. Cause you have to be so much more precise in your flying. Um, so I, I might actually make some people fly this map next week um, without any ships on it, just to see how well they can, well, they can get around it. Cool. Cool. Excellent. All right, Phil. I got it. Got it. <laughs> all right. I got the uh, restraining bull. Here you go. Excellent, excellent. Hey, J-Bot, look at that. <laughs> what? Huh? <laughs> excellent, excellent. I'm glad you're feeling better. I bet it was cathartic to get that out of your system. <laughs> it's I, like I said, I wasn't really mad, just kind of perturbed. Yeah, here, let me purge those those memories. Hang on. <laughs> excellent. Good job. All right. Now, um, since Phil took some while, took a while, I was actually able to, to to pull up something here. I just found about Dengar, just to go back to it. It's a it's a like a poster for Dengar bail bonds. Picture Dengar, Dengar's <laughs> motto: "I won't get knocked into no pit by some blind guy." <laughs> Dengar's bail bonds. Go with him. <laughs> so I thought it was funny. Yeah, on your talk about bounty hunters, I. I Obviously, being a fan of the the online game, I should have just put my character on there. I said my favorite character <laughs> is my bounty hunter from the video game because he was awesome. Yeah, he did. Well, and, but yeah, I always had taglines like that too for my characters. Which my guild was like, "Oh god, anytime we bring in a new person, Jonathan's going to be posting up uh, all his new you know, advertising slogans for his uh, bounty hunting <laughs> services." <laughs> too funny. All right, so should we go into the main topic uh, for today's episode, Mission 3? Yeah, let's go to the uh, ready room. Finally getting back to it. Stand by alert. Stand by alert. Yeah, so we haven't done actually Mission 3. <laughs> we started with Mission 1 and 2. We've done a few others, but we, I think we got stalled at 3. I think our enthusiasm for this particular <laughs> mission is really what killed it, because, I don't know, I'm not really a fan of this mission. Yeah, this one is definitely on the top of my list in terms of missions that uh, do not stand the test of time. Yeah. Um, how did you guys, how did you, how did you guys uh, play it? Well, we played um, it broken, of course. Yeah, I think we, we <laughs> probably broke it, although we did really try really hard to, to follow the rules. Uh, I'm sure we probably screwed it up, though, once we start describing it. Um, no, well, we, we set it up. We, we played it a few months ago, and 
but we couldn't remember, so we set it up again. And I I made up two lists, one for for each side, wondering, you know, just in case, because I I want to have the option to play. And then um, yeah, of course, Jbot didn't have a list, so he just took mine and complained about my options. <laughs> the, yeah, no, no one specifically that he planned. Like Jbot always takes the rebels, so I'll just give him a crappy list, and and uh, it was all you know gamesmanship, I'm sure. All right, so let's let's talk about the uh, the mission setup, and uh... I I'm just gonna go ahead and skip the the list that they recommend because it's from the core set, and right. that's kind of boring. They're for like uh, twenty points or something. Yeah, that's it's very. Yeah, so basically each player gets hundred points. Right, we're playing with the hundred point version. Yeah, and then the special rules scanning. So. Well, let's talk about the the satellites. So. All right. Um, so after you uh, after the Imperial player places their ships uh, in the play area at range one of their side, as as per normal. Um. Well, it's sort of as normal. The the Imperial player places all their ships first. Yep. Uh, before it any side, terrain goes the down. The that you're on. Yeah. Uh, then what happens next is the Rebel player places all the satellites that are going to go down, and these are. The, these are the uh, tokens that the whole mission is based around. So, uh, with a 100-point mission, you're going to have five satellites. You're going to place two satellites at range three, within range three of the Rebel Table Edge, but farther away than uh, range... Er, they're farther away than range one of the like neutral edges, is how I, how I read this. Uh... So you have two satellites like that at range three of the Rebel Edge, two satellites at range two of the Rebel Edge, and one satellite within range one of the Rebel Edge for five. Right, satellites. so it's almost like bands, you know, range one band, exactly. range two band, range three yeah. band. And they can't be yeah. at range one of the neutral edges. Right. Well, I can already see one mistake that was made. We said range two of the... No, it was all range three. <laughs> that's what, that's what yeah, no, it was it, range it, two. Yeah, the because it was the, so compressed. I was like, "What's the?" I barely. No, got no we did range two. Each each satellite token be range two or further away from both edges of play. So it's range. Right. Two. So you said it had to be in range three. You said it had to be outside range two. So that's why all of them. If you remember, they were all in this little circle. Because that well, that's your fault. Because I said range two or farther. <laughs> oh, okay. You didn't ask me like, why did you put those all so close together? When I was complaining, I was like, "There's barely any room to put these down." <laughs> And you're like, that's what the rules say. <laughs> I handed you the range two <laughs> marker. R right, the range well, two marker. Well, but you should have handed so the range one marker, actually. You should have handed me the range one marker. But it says here, no, it says each sat each satellite token is range two or farther away from both edges of play, of the play area. So they can't be closer to the board edge than range two. Uh, mm, but they can no. be at range two. So right. right, but I didn't say they couldn't. Yeah, but you handed them the range one marker. <laughs> Oh, all you right, need, right. all you need is a range two. one, you know, and all right, the all tricky right. wording. Anyway, <laughs> so now I see that that the trick was played on me again. Oh, it is stupid wording. <laughs> stupid <laughs> restrictions. Don't be at range one. That's what you need to say. Don't be at range one. Not range two or further. Uh... Yeah. So okay. So I call shenanigans on this one again. Ah! We, no matter how many times we read these things, oh, we can't. I don't think it made right. that much of an impact, though. I do. I mean, they were literally, it's like, oh, I'm going to sweep past this one and straight into the next one and just do a nice <laughs> U around around the set of them. Because they they had to be so close together inside that little kind of box. And they're stuck at those band, you know, inside each of those bands that they're like, I literally had to put one on the back edge of the map in order to get the other four into the, into the, uh, into the map where we had our little mm -hmm. zones. All right. Okay. All right. And then, uh, then I assume the uh, rebel player places their ships, right? Um, uh huh. Does it actually say when the rebel player places their ships? <laughs> they don't place them. It doesn't say in the rules that they should place them, so it's they don't weird. get to put them on the board. Yeah, I don't. I don't see it in here. I mean, maybe that's just we're, we're reading this off of Wikipedia. Uh, like wicked, yeah. This is a wikia summary, so it might be, might have been lost from the uh, original. Just Makes me think of old wiki wacky or 
old Ewok. Ah, uh, it brings a tear to the eye. Yeah. He's a loyal okay. Ewok. He was actually a good one. Oh, well. All right. Well, special rule scanning. So instead of performing an attack during the combat phase, an Imperial ship that is overlapping a satellite token may scan the token. To do so, he removes the satellite token from the play area and places it on the scanning ship's ship card. A ship may scan more than one satellite token. Phil, you want to do the next? So basically, yeah. you land on top of a, a satellite, you don't shoot, you can scan. That's right. Um... Yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, just want to keep in mind that like, if your movement template overlaps a satellite token, that doesn't do you any good. Your base has to be overlapping a satellite token during the combat phase. And you can do an action. So you can do a boost or barrel roll or some other action. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's the one thing I would take away. is I'd say it has to be an action, not a taking away your attack. Because that, that ability for... <clears throat> with all the kind of uh, arc dodging that a lot of Imperial ships have makes it in a sense very easy to get on top of one just be relatively close to it and you can uh, barrel roll onto it or boost onto well, it. you see i disagree i think that you didn't miss a single one <laughs> well i'm, I'm sorry and there were a lot pilot, of, and if, no no it was and they were all from barrel rolls like he did not know it was barrel rolls. On oh in that case I he's took, a bad um, pilot yeah no i didn't use barrel <laughs> specifically <laughs> took um what was it uh, was it was it Daredevil? No. What's the one for an action? You get to do the the one well, for a turn. Okay, so I should say you had to use an action to get every single one of them. There wasn't. Yes, a, but I you had to all. cheat. You had to cheat. Just admit it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I planned it that way. Yeah. Well, all right. Regardless, it does. It is not really. I I didn't get the impression that it was super hard to to land on these satellites. Although the satellite no, aren't, aren't really big. Well, as long as you get the actions, it's it can be a real challenge. I think we talked before about how being being good at actually moving ships, you know, knowing where you are, it, it can be a challenge to actually get get on those. I, I think it can be a bit of a challenge. I kind of expected it, and I remember playing it before and knowing that it's hard. So, so I kind of planned accordingly. I'm right. Yeah. To remember. It can, it can, it. You can have problems landing on these, but um, I, I didn't run into problems either. Really hitting mine. All right, so, actually, I use Daredevil. So Daredevil, you basically do the the one hard turn maneuver. Yeah. yeah. And and that's what I did, and was able to land on two of them that way because it it made it a lot easier. <laughs> the Daredevil EPT. Okay. Uh. So we have a scanning special rule. We also have the rebel reinforcement special rule. This one. But wait, leads... wait. There's still more for scanning, though. Oh, you you weren't done with the scanning. Okay. So no, no, no. the next part of the scanning is uh, if a rebel ship is overlapping a satellite, then an imperial ship that is touching that rebel ship, which is overlapping the satellite, may scan the satellite as if the imperial ship were overlapping the satellite. So you can't just block yeah. a satellite by you know hogging up the the real estate with a uh, Rebel ship base, the um, anti-blocking rule. Yeah, right. And it actually makes it easier for the Imperials to scan the satellite because it's much easier to block, to you know, land on a, a ship than it is to land on a satellite. Yep, I'll go with that. And that if an Imperial ship is destroyed after scanning, um, then return all satellite tokens, um, get them out of the game. So basically, if let's say you've got one ship and it scans all of your the satellites and then it dies, you lose the game, so to speak. Right. Um, I'm not really sure how. I think you could actually. Just, I don't, I'm not sure if that rule is necessary because the imperial victory uh, condition is that you have to have at least one imperial ship that scanned a satellite flee off the imperial edge of the play area. Right, um, but I, I guess basically. So if you've been destroyed, if, you're probably not going to flee off an edge. So right, right. But if you're the, destroyed, the they don't go back to the table or, or anything. That's what that is. Yeah, I, I suppose you could get rid of it like that. I mean, I don't know why they would go back to the table either. But because if, if you don't say so, someone's yeah. like, "Well, maybe there'd I'll, someone be confused." Man, if my yeah. guy dies. He's got him. Then they all the scans yeah. drop. Okay, like okay, that. that may okay that that makes some sense then. You know um, those players. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, all right. Um, so I think that the scanning rules are, are, are pretty much fine, right? Yep. I mean, I don't really have a big problem with these. Um, the Rebel Reinforcements is the next special rule. So this one reads, during the end phase, the Rebel player may call for one reinforcement for each Rebel ship that was destroyed during the round. Uh, for each reinforcement, he takes one Rookie Pilot ship card and places it outside the play area. Then he takes one Rookie Pilot ship within range range one of his um, of the edge of his play area. Uh, the Rebel player can assign maneuvers, blah blah blah, it's his ship. Um, yeah. So, you guys see any problem with that? <laughs> that I, I don't have any issue with it. <laughs> I, um, if I were the, the Rebels, I'd want to take paper, like, a whole basically. bunch of Z95s. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> to rush Start the game with eight Z95s facing your edge, fly them off the board, <laughs> come back with eight <laughs> X-Wings. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I, I don't know. I guess they didn't imagine that Rebels would have cheaper ships than, than X-Wings? I don't know. This is bad <laughs> they foresight. They didn't at the time, so... Yeah. Yeah. For, uh, but, I don't really have an issue with it, except for unscrupulous players. Um, but uh, <laughs> I don't have an issue with it, because to me it's a waste of paper, to be honest with you. A waste of ink and paper, that, that whole reinforcements rule. Reinforcements, yeah. Reinforcements yeah, are... Yeah, I, our match took stupid. five turns. It, it was like he didn't even really shoot anybody. <laughs> he just, exactly. Just, yeah, there's yeah. no point in it. It's why would just, you bother? You know, yeah, I, well, I did especially all. Especially, why would you bother if the if the other player is going to have reinforcements? If they didn't have reinforcements, right. then uh, it might make some sense to try and and uh, just beat the other guy in a, a straight up fight. You know. Well, right. Yeah. So I I shot I shot when. It was, you know, when it was appropriate, I did shoot. It's not like I, I refused to shoot, but I didn't set myself up to to actually do the attacking. I went straight for the satellites, and I spent all my action tokens on defensive maneuvers. Right, right, because that makes sense. Um, I, one, one thing that I'll just say generally about reinforcements and, the, and these types of things and this how this is set up... Um, when one when either player when you have like a, a hundred versus hundred point game like this, and uh, both players start with uh, equal number of points, and one player has an extra way to win the game. So like the imperial player in this in this scenario can win by collecting all up all the satellite tokens, right? Uh, if we didn't have the rebel, re if we didn't have the reinforcements rule, then the imperial player could also win by killing all the rebel ships. Yeah. The rebel player has to win by killing all the imperial ships, or killing all the ones that picked up satellite tokens. If all the satellite tokens have already been picked up, um, it's, it's just something to keep in mind when you're designing a scenario: is that you don't want to give both players. Uh, a way to win the mission where they have an equal chance and then give another player on top of that another way to win the mission because that gives them an, an advantage in the scenario. So that's kind of why Rebel Reinforcements is here, I think. So that the uh, Imperial player can't just win by killing all the Rebels. So they only have one way to win and the Rebels only have one way to win. That said, you know, in this scenario, I think the Imperials just always go for the satellites anyway. Yeah. Even if you didn't have Rebel Reinforcement Rule, I think it's an easier way to win. Now, I think I think this mission suffers from um, new stuff being too powerful. I think if you restricted the TIE Fighter, or if you restricted the Imperials to be just TIE Fighters, like you said... You guys can only take regular old TIE Fighters. You can't take anything else. It might be more of a game. Yeah. Uh, it would It would be interesting to go back and test this one with you know, restricted to corset stuff, for example. Um, I'm not sure if I, if I really want to spend my time doing that, but... <laughs> right. Like, uh, I wouldn't restrict Rebels from, from, you know, Wave 1 stuff, but I would definitely restrict 
Imperials, not even just Wave 1 stuff, but just TIE Fighters. Yeah, yeah. Corset. Um, yeah. So, uh, I didn't catch. What would uh, you guys take for this mission? So, this was actually my first time taking the TIE Striker. I wanted to put the TIE Striker on the table. So I took Countdown as, as the TIE Striker, and I took two... Tie advanced prototypes with the V1 uh, pilot. Remind me what countdown special rule is. Oh, he's the one. He's the good one. So basically, oh. <laughs> um, if you take more damage than one. You can just take a stress token and only take one damage. Right. That's what I thought. Yeah. Um, then uh, I took two tie advanced prototypes that with the V1 title where basically you take a target lock, you get a evade token because that's so easy. And I also took um, Daredevil on both of them because they get that extra little, you know, hard turn. And then I took just some TIE Fighters. Okay, so, what did uh, what'd J-Bot take? Oh, I wrote that list for him. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, I don't even know what it was now, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> there was an arc in it and... Uh... Else yeah, to... Braylon Strom, I think I took with him, and I think R three A two. I think I put a B wing in there. Yeah, uh, there's a B wing uh, in there. A Z ninety five with a concussion missile and guidance chip, uh, and something else. <laughs> the the uh, little ship from the Ghost set. Oh yeah, yeah, an attack shuttle with a um, auto blaster turret. Because I thought that would be good to basically, because you know where they're going to go, and you know they're going to be a bunch of Imperial little zippy ships. So get an auto blaster, just kind of, just get in, and you have a range one bubble of death was the idea. And even if you don't, you've got three attack out the main front, and it might be a little bit on the weak side, but no one's going to be shooting at you. So I thought that was exactly. fine. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting idea to sort of just maybe like mob one satellite token and. Um, or just you know create a try to try to prevent the Imperials from picking up one or two satellite tokens because you can prevent the Imperials from winning because in order to win the Imperials need to scan all the satellite tokens they have to pick up all the satellite tokens off the board and then they need to escape with one of their ships that scanned a satellite that has a satellite token right yeah so if you can but, prevent the Imperials from picking up one or two satellites and you know killing off their ships in the meantime, you can win as the as the rebels. Yeah, we um he put one satellite token on the board edge, touching his board edge, which was really hard to get to. In my first pass, I missed it, and I yeah, had to he, do my. That was the only one he had any struggle with, but uh, he got it on the second pass. So. Yeah, with Daredevil. But that's part of the thing is what – so my guy zipped in. I managed to get scans. One of my guys, as soon as he got the scan, just booked it for the board edge and wanted just to hover around the edge. And then I just needed to land on and scan to get the last satellite. And as soon as I had them, those other guys can die. That one person who scanned it was waiting by the edge of the table edge and could just run. Right. I was just I, – I just thought of a way you can really uh, game this uh... – Scenario with the with the rebel uh, with the rebel list. If you took two uh, large base ships and put them facing each other in front and of bumped. the in front of the satellite token that is on your edge, but in a way so that maybe place the satellite token sideways and then place your ships so they aren't actually overlapping the satellite token but not leave enough space for a small ship base there. So you see what I'm saying here? You have, you're basically you're, blocking them. <laughs> you're blocking them without blocking it. You're not. You're blocking it you're without overlapping it. it. So the you're Imperials would have right. to kill those ships first, which means they would have to stick around uh, longer than they that's, want to. That's pretty funny. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Yeah, that's... I mean, it's an exploit that they wouldn't... They obviously didn't see, but... I mean, you could theoretically do that. You don't even need the large base ships. You can technically do that with two small base ships. I, mean, really, I guess if you had them at an angle. Uh, 
I mean, well, if I mean, if they go one, they can't pass each other. Oh, that's you know? true. So you could say, I'm just going to take a bunch of Y wings and put <laughs> put two covering the, the front. Or yeah, with auto blast turrets, two covering the front, and then the another pair of them essentially banking in or not banking in, but hitting into the sides of the uh, or the back sides of those two, and just put a little bubble around the last one. Say, come on in, guys. You're you're welcome to. <laughs> the but, water's uh, fine. Yeah, just I mean, you could put almost anything on at that point: two auto blasters and two TLTs, and then uh, yeah, just come on at me, guys. I got plenty of plenty of guns pointing out, but uh, it's kind of a cheesy fortress. Oh, definitely, it's super cheesy. But, uh, it'll be rather funny, <laughs> but uh, might be my only chance of winning this scenario. Well, I think if you force the Imperials to go with only Tie Fighters, then the Rebels have a chance because I think part of it is you've got to have enough firepower to just knock out Imperial ship after Imperial ship. Mm-hmm. How about how about you take two Y wings with TLTs, so they cost twenty four points each, and then you take you fill up the rest of the list with Z ninety fives, and you fly the Z ninety fives off the board, <laughs> come back with X wings. So how many X wings could you get like that? Probably four X wings or so. Probably four X wings. Yeah, probably. Yeah. So you have yeah, four X wings cool. and two TLT Y wings, guarding the the last satellite. You might be able to win as the rebels like that. Yeah, just just feeding uh, X wings to the to the Empire side. Just basically, oh yeah, you killed one. Whoops, here comes another one, sort of thing. Just right. don't even the Y wings just play defense, and the uh, <laughs> and the X wings just swoop around, dying and, and uh, doing whatever they can. Oh Jesus! I mean, you could. Oh my God! Actually, there's no way that the Imperials could win because, okay, say you've got your two Y wings or whatever blocking the the satellite. Right, facing each other, blocking the satellite. Um, what happens when those Y wings die? Yeah, they get X wings. You get X wings. Yeah, they come the back as X wings. Right, right in the same exact spot. So yeah, you just you keep can't parking ever clear two, that. Just keep parking two X wings right over. Oh my god, that's, that's pretty funny. <laughs> and that and that is something that could have happened. Uh, you know, like yeah, without, could have happened in the original game, or I guess set. in the original you can do that course, in the course set. set. So, yeah, but nobody thought like that back we've, then. We've the Every, everybody scenario. wanted to fly the ships back then. They didn't want to <laughs> right. park them and play fortress. Fortress. Yeah, yeah they didn't have fortressing back then. Only a few people that uh, got ostracized from the uh, fandom pretty quickly would actually fortress back then. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, so that's crazy. I I'm not, not too much of a fan of this mission. No. Um. So. No, definitely not a fan of it. Let me tell you what, what I flew for this mission. Uh, so I, I did a, a few tests on a Vassal um, with myself here. And what I did was I took four TIE Phantoms for the Imperials. Oh, the oh my god, it's broken. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, going for maximum brokenness on the Imperial side and also going for maximum uh, exploit brokenness on the uh, Rebel side, or at least what I thought was, I guess the maximum really is just blocking the satellite but I took a uh, eight c95 flew off the board and, <laughs> and then got gave myself eight <laughs> x-wings <laughs> so he, so he did. it was eight x-wings versus four fans it wasn't just talk <laughs> uh, it was a it was a kooky game the Imperials won just because it's hard to kill four phantoms um, before they pick up the satellite tokens. and eight, they're so maneuverable eight, they can pick eight, up the satellites eight, really easy. That's why phantoms suck. I hate them. Oh, I hate phantoms. <laughs> yeah, the phantoms once... in this one didn't even have to attack, and that's the only thing you hate is that four that's attack right. dice. No, it's not the only. Thing. I do hate well, the king and the the four attack dice. That then, of course, Cloak can get within range one, so it's really five dice. Blah blah blah. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, the the Imperials won that one, even even with the eight X wings. So that that's pretty, just, that's pretty shows gross. even how ugly broken phantoms are. <laughs> it's just because the the phantoms they, yeah, they, they needed like one yeah. or two turns to for all those phantoms to pick up all those satellite tokens, and then the X wings cannot chase down and catch a phantom that's trying to escape because he just decloaks straight to and does a, a straight four maneuver and then cloaks. I mean, if we take, let's see. 
that's 168 points of Rebel X-Wings versus 100 or less of the Phantoms. And you can't exactly win. 100, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, and you can't beat them. That's just the ridiculous part. That's yeah. just absurd. Well, I mean, well he if, could have beat him. He just didn't yeah. realize there was an even cheesier way of <laughs> at well, the time. Yeah. I could have auto let's won. Just say, let's say you took eight X-Wings on the table and four yeah. tie Phantoms. The Phantoms would win. Like, well, I don't know if you they would win in a straight-up fight. These were Phantoms that were staying cloaked the entire time. They didn't have advanced cloaking device, so they weren't getting shots. Um, you know, I think that the X-Wings definitely would have beaten them in a straight-up fight. All right, all right. But, but they, in the mission... Yeah, the Phantoms were able to to pick up all the satellites and then escape with one Phantom. Yeah, run silent, run deep. Exactly, yeah. yeah. All right, all right. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty cheese delicious. Yeah, this is definitely... Like I said, this is one of those missions that... Uh, does not stand up to the test of time. The only thing I can think of is if you force the Imperial to take nothing but TIE fighters, and then the Rebels can take whatever they want. All right, but you have to have that. You have to have a rule in there for the Rebels now to keep somebody from just cheesing the system, because there well, is there is literally no way you can stop them if you do that, because you can park two there, and since attacking is after movement, then uh, there's no way to ever get on that token. Because they're just going to respawn two ships right in the same spot. I think if you're going to if you're going to play this, you're going to have to set up a gentleman's agreement. So like the Imperial player will only take Tie Fighters, and the Rebel player won't do that park and block or fly all his guys off the board edge, and then play the mission like that in the gentleman's agreement would be the only way to make this playable. I think you also have to change the scan rules. Uh, you have to change the scan so that you can do it at uh, range one. You don't have to be overlapping. Uh, I would say that. Um, the, I think the overlap is the hard part, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the overlap also allows you to block a, a satellite. If, I guess if you eliminate reinforcements. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so here's what I would do. I would eliminate the reinforcements rule. I would add a few points to the rebel side. Add, like, five or ten points to the rebel uh, squad points. Like 110. Points. Yeah, like 110. And so that way, the Imperials, if they really want to win, then they really need to go after the satellites. Uh, that would help out a lot. They wouldn't They wouldn't have really have the, a viable option of winning in a straight-up fight. Uh, but they would still have motivation to to kill enemy ships and whatnot because they're not going to come back. You know, I wonder if you changed it to, I hate to say an action because I think you need sometimes the actions to get on the the device, you know, the the satellites. Yeah, but, I wouldn't be so so broken up about it. But but if you took away the action, therefore they didn't have any defensive tokens and could be wiped out. Does that make sense? Yeah, they're easy to shoot. Yeah, um, easy to shoot once they get them or as they're getting them. Uh, another, th I mean, I, I have a mission like that is sort of like this uh, that I'm developing for the uh, narrative campaign or the narrative event, which is um, it's it's framed as a, a reconnaissance mission, and uh, the Imperials need to uh, scan at certain points uh, in the map, uh, but they can only scan with a uh, one particular ship. Uh, the, Re the Imperials actually start with more points than the Rebels. Uh, the Rebels are trying to kill the reconnaissance ship before it picks up scan points. Uh, and the Imperials are just trying to prevent that and pick up as many scan points as they can. Um, it's it's similar in that it's it's all about getting to some spot on the board and uh, just pretty much just getting to a spot on the board, right? That's it's the same underlying mechanic. Uh, yeah, getting somewhere and scanning. Yeah, yeah, that comes up often in uh, in X-wing scenarios. Yeah, I think maybe 
making it range one to scan, and then scans in action would actually make it deadlier to the Imperial forces. It, it'd be easier, yeah. but deadlier for them to do it. So it'd be kind of yeah. more of a challenge. And as, as you know, in this scenario, as written, the Imperials losing their attack is really no, no great loss to them. No consequence. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you think of those changes, Jaybot? Oh, well, I'm, I just don't like the the general scenario because there's nothing to entice the Imperial player to do anything other than what you did, which is run across, get one of the first ones that you can, and have that ship just tear off across the the map, and then well, the other one's just suicide for the other. Right? Yeah. There's there's really nothing to prevent that short of the, the rebel player either being cheesy or um, being able to tear through all of the other i mean because you could do that in a sense with one tie fighter so you might have you know 80 plus points that you have to dig through uh with your 100 points um uh, before they can land on uh, stationary targets while you're moving because there's nothing to allow the the uh rebel player to park like he can't park and hover on something and the really the closest he can do is essentially a, a hard two circle around these things to just kind of circle one so Short of like circling the wagons around one of them and and just you know entice or basically telling the imperial player you're gonna have to go through three or four ships that are just in a nice little circle around one of them. Um, I don't really see any good way to make this uh, well, uh, make this super. It, it, to me, it doesn't feel balanced. I guess is what I'm getting at. So oh, I take away the action of the imperial players. Well, that gets rid of an evade or a focus from I would say there's definitely a way to balance it. You, you can balance this mission. You can fix those exploits. You can balance the mission. I'm not sure that you can make it fun. <laughs> right. Maybe, maybe, events, that, right? maybe that's what I'm after. Is that It's like if you say, oh, I can scan at range one, but I have to give up my action. To me, that's easier to, to do, to get to range yes, one of one of these the things. Same time, so here's the thing, though. So your your big concern is... is not being able to defend against the closest one to the enemy, right? No, it's not even that. It's that you have, in a 100-point game, you have two of them that are out at range three, right? So your your ships, if you fill out and you have five, I think is what you had, five or six ships that you had on your side. Um, if you have five or six ships, you can run essentially one or two at, at, the, at those front two and still have another one that's spare. Um, well, let's put it this way. Let's say you've got – if you limit the Imperials to just TIE Fighters. So we're talking between like six and eight TIE Fighters. I uh, see. That's even worse. Like so, that, That's the thing But imagine this is. though. Imagine if the Rebels had like 110 points. You can get like five X-Wings for that. You know, or even more Z-95s or a combination thereof. So that if you had enough ships to actually rush out and meet the first wave of TIE Fighters – Worst thing you could do, absolutely worst thing you could do, is to rush out and try and meet these things in the middle of the table, because TIE fighters are faster. They just blow right by you, and you're going to get one pass. Well, I mean, but you it's, it's a pure joust. Closer. It's a pure joust at that point. Like I have to kill essentially four of these things on the way through, and then turn around and kill what's remainder on the way back. Like so, I'm, I'm getting essentially two passes on these, on the well, on the ties. So so to me, the thing is, if you've got enough ships on the defense for the rebels, that you could actually go out to meet them, at least some of them meet them, at least on one of those, uh, you know, satellites, is that if you can block them from just getting that one and zipping back to the line. The thing is, when you get then, if you get within range of one and you have to spend your action to scan, you're probably going to be toast because at that point there's enough rebels on the table that somebody can light you up yeah because I, if you've got no defensive action yeah there, there's got some of them like, so <clears throat> modified I, <clears throat> sorry um i think that some of the the core problems are just how you win uh as the imperials by escaping with one of these ships um with just one ship that scanned a, a satellite that's that's a core problem with the scenario because, um, like you said, you can just it's too easy to escape as an imperial player, uh, and it's also easy to swarm like all of the 
the satellites as an Imperial player because you get a lot of ships, you have a lot of ships with repositioning abilities, etc., etc. Um, the way I I build my uh, Gen Con narrative mission for this, and it, again, it's a similar type of scenario, uh, is that the rebels get their points by killing Imperial ships primarily. They get their <clears throat> they get their points by killing Imperial ships and uh, keeping uh, scan points on the table unscanned. So the the rebels are in a race to kill the Imperial ship that's scanning. Uh, the Imperials get points for killing rebel ships. And they also get points for scanning uh, scan points. Right. Okay. So so this is different in in a, in a number of ways. And in the Imperial once you scan a, a point as the Imperial, you have those points forever. You don't lose those points. But you only have one ship that can scan. So the balance in that scenario is all about um, how fast the rebels can kill that that one ship. And remember, the rebels have fewer points than the Imperials. So the rebels can't just go up in a straight-up fight and expect to win. The Imperials uh, have the liability of their uh, their reconnaissance ship. Because if they lose that, then they forfeit all the rest of the points on the table for those uh, those scanning points. So they're, they're at the same time that they're forced to put that ship out there the rebels are forced to engage because they can't uh, they can't dilly dally and they can't uh, wait for that imperial reconnaissance ship to pick up all those scan points which are just free points to them uh, both sides are, in, are incentivized to engage each other um, both sides have multiple ways to, to get points it's not just a straight up and down the other advantage to that is that it's not just a straight up or down um, victory. Uh, it's all about getting points for your team, uh, which is an advantage I, over over this. Because in a in a standalone mission, you want just an up or down win. The more I hear about these missions that we're doing um, or that you're making, um, I I love the fact that ion weapons are going to be so brutal. <laughs> you know, I just think <laughs> yeah, that like would be, yeah. ion turrets and ion cannons and ion torpedoes are going to be like could have massive impact on the game you know because if you're able to like ionize half the the imperial screening forces you know you could get to that ship i don't know it's just so exciting to me i can't wait to play these these missions i i so so do we all give mission three you know thumbs down <laughs> i think we <laughs> yeah as written i'd say send thumbs it down. back for major revisions yeah yeah. All right. So Dark Whispers gets the the dark thumb. All right. <laughs> All right. So we could probably put that one to rest. Um, and last week we ran out of time, and we did get to talk about any of our Sea Rock builds. Um, and I kind of want to. I, I had fun doing that, and I wanted to talk about some of the different Sea Rock options and builds. And you know, do you guys want to go through and do that now? Yeah. Let's let's find out what we have cooking in our uh, crock pots. <laughs> What's been uh, cooking? Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> wah, wah, wah. Oh, in our crockpots. All right. So who wants to go first? J-Bot, do you want to go first? I'll give you the option. Sure. Why not? Um, now that you've got experience. That, that way you can all tell player. me what I did wrong. <laughs> or you can steal it. Yeah. Um, okay. So obviously Sea Rock. That's the 35 points on the thing. Um, and the general theme I was going here with this is uh, – uh, in a way, ordnance obviously is the the big thing for this ship, um, and then stress generation uh, would be the rest of the list. So things like uh, rebel captives and that sort of stuff to try and um, push stress onto uh, wait the rebel opponent. captive. That's imperial only. Sorry, I was thinking uh, I was thinking imperial side. I'm so used to there not being a scum <laughs> ship. So like I said, I, that was me throwing out uh, other ships, which I didn't really think of. Um, so it would be it would be stress generating stuff if I could find it on the scum side. I don't play enough scum. Um, but uh, uh, ordnance tubes and uh, homing missiles. That's kind of the the uh, central piece um, of the ship itself. So its offensive capability would be the ordnance tubes and homing missiles. Um, and then I have a uh, weapons engineer for the target locks. 
Um, so I guess theoretically it could fire out two a turn. Is that right? If I'm doing that math right? Yeah, you get um, two uh, two target locks. And so yep. you'd be able to fire out one but, per target lock, correct? Yeah. Well, but no, you can fire you can fire each hard point once is what it is. Oh, okay. So, okay, that makes sense. Either way, but so you have another target place. lock out there. You have options. So that's important because so the you're next be turn by your target locks. The next turn, you can spend your action doing something other than getting a target lock. Right, I understand that, but it, he was on there not really fully understanding that I can only fire one a turn. So, um, so like I said, y'all can tear it apart as we go. Um, I'd put uh, frequency jammer on there um, for the additional stress every turn. So if I use the, I think it's the jam um, action. That Super jam, put, yep. Yeah, it puts a stress yeah. on somebody, then the frequency jammer essentially lets me put a second one That's right. um, onto another ship. Yep. Um, <clears throat> to go along with that, slicer tools um, with the opportunity to essentially hurt two ships every turn if I'm yeah. doing the, the jamming. Um, possibly more if I've got a, a support class of ships that can add stresses to, to other ships. Um, in a sense, this is, to me, it almost feels like a free damage on the uh, arc dodging types of ships um, or stealth ships, that now, sort of how stuff. Does, how does the damage work for that? Do you Are you assigning, like... Face down damage cards, or you, they suffer one damage for for slicer. Yeah, Action, yeah slicer. choose one or more enemy ships at range one to three that have a stress token. For each ship chosen, you may spend one energy to cause that ship to suffer one damage. Okay, suffer one damage. Yeah, so suffer. One yeah, damage. shields will still keep block that it. Straight with uh, black market slicer tools. Yeah, and so sh one of the things that still block it, but it would, uh, but uh, it doesn't take very many of those to to kind of eat through the really fast and agile ships. Definitely, definitely. And you, and you don't have you, to roll um, the dice for it. The correct. Only, That's the only key. frustrating part is that you have to spend an action to jam and you have to spend an action to use slicer tools. So you couldn't do both in the same turn. Right, but to me it's a setup sort of thing. So yeah. if, if your weapon's engineering on one turn, for example, then you know that for the next turn after this one, you're not going to need to do that necessarily because you'll have, uh, unless you just badly positioned, you'll have a uh, target for your, for your missile already. Um Okay, so uh, on top of that, I put uh, Ordnance Expert to help me out with my missile. Um, that, I believe, turns a blank to a hit uh, when you roll. Yep. Um, and it says Friendly Ship within range 1, so I assume that includes me. It does. Um, when it's Friendly Ship, it includes yourself. Uh, I put a Gunnery Team on this, which I think also helps. Um, I, I haven't looked at this. Yeah, been or the energy. You weeks. spend the energy to... Yeah. Yeah, I, th well, I can't remember exactly what it does, but uh, I seem to recall it helping. It's been a couple weeks since I looked at this. How many? Um, wait, how many teams was that? Two teams. So he yeah, would go teams. for the oh, title. Oh, you have the title. Yeah. Okay. I didn't. I'm still going through. But the uh, and then Zuckus was the last one. I, I I felt like the title was a gimme. Like you always had to take the title. It's the only one I got. So. Yeah. I mean, how, that many, makes how many points is that? Or I don't remember how much the title costs. So I didn't write it down, but oh, I mean, the rest overall, of this the whole ship. six, yeah, sixty-eight points. Um, I title don't remember. is two points. Yeah, so seventy 70. points. Yeah, I thought it was seventy. I just didn't have it written down here. Um, so seventy points total. When I put Zuckus on there to make, you know, because to make people re-roll against my ordinance. So I basically want my ordinance to every time it hits to really hit as much as possible, since it's the only attack the ship has yeah. outside yeah, of yeah. the stress Definitely. mechanic. Um, but to me, I looked at it like there's not going to be a lot of energy usage other than regening the shields uh, whenever necessary, other than burning the stresses off of people uh, with the uh, slicer tools. So yeah. I thought if I could build the rest of the list, um, either with a second sea rock that does very similar things, um, really the only change would need to be Zuckus, I think. I don't think anything else on here was unique. Um, you have, and, and then the rest of the, the actual list with small ships that either cause stress or, or, or do similar sorts of things. <clears throat> you right. can, you can hammer stuff because you have enough energy generation every turn moving relatively slowly to, in a sense, use every stress that you're putting out every turn, um, between two ships and, and really just, oh, this automatic damage, automatic damage. You, 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 everybody gets one. Yay. It's like, uh, Oprah. Right. <laughs> and uh, and then of course I have a homing missile just you know just to just to piss people off that's going to be really hard to dodge because of Zuckus and uh, all the dice modification that that the rest of the crews and things give it. So and your the rest of your list you can put things like tacticians out there or you can put 
know, thermal detonator bombs on Y wings. You oh, know, I forgot. I did put cluster just... bombs on there just for giggles. Um, yeah, just just because I was like, oh, you never know when you're. That might be the perfect play, for example. Yeah. Um, just you can also... look at all this stuff shooting behind me at range one. I'm just going to use the cluster bomb and ruin their days. You could even use flechette. Uh, cannons on some heavy seeks just to go out there and throw some stress out on people. You know, <laughs> normally you would that's, think, yeah, that's true. Things, but yeah, that's that is very true. Like I said, I didn't really delve too deep into the rest of the list, um, but that would be my goal: is to essentially go with stress causing ships, whether it's uh, flesh, flechette torpedoes and and flechette cannons, that sort of stuff. Or um, if there's crew, I'd have to look through the scum crew to see. Uh, but that sort of thing to really just kind of mess with. Uh, uh, the stresses and use the the sea rock as a missile platform that's using most of its energy to to pop these stress uh, points on people. And I, I mean, it's it's conceivable the thing could do two to three points for free every turn just from the stress. Um, just you know, jam well, not every turn. <clears throat> or, well, I guess you're you're handing yeah. out stress. Well, yeah, because yeah. it's just stress. Like if if you're not having to regenerate, you're like, hey, I'm giving you a stress and you a stress, and at the same time, the stress is really messing up ships yeah, yeah. Uh, if you're slow rolling and other things are giving out the stress you can spend your action spending your you know three or four energy a turn to dish out correct. damage to people and you don't need yeah. the energy to fire your weapons so right right so that's, that's the idea and and the the jam ability to give somebody two stresses is is really powerful Powerful to me, so Jamoni, yeah, yeah. You can because yeah, you can hit in a sense of like a pal basis. You could hit one of these guys that's flittering all over the place and really ruin his day uh, with two stresses because it's going to be really difficult to clear <laughs> to clear that and, and continue <laughs> to dance around um, every turn. So um, it sounds cool. Uh, I I guess if I if I were to offer criticism, uh, I think it, it's probably overloaded. Think oh yeah, the problem yeah. you run into with these is if you want to put them in an epic list, you have to have the things loaded down for bear because I don't know. I mean, under thirty points. I don't if think you have to a, have a seventy point sea rock to have a, a functioning ship on the table. You definitely well, no, have to put something on it. No, what I mean is like if you play with the non-official FFG rules for for oh. epic, for yeah. you have to get to one hundred and thirty points in, in epic ships, then you're either running three of these things or you're running two of them that. Are really heavily loaded and yeah I, I i don't think many people play with that in particular version of rules so you know it's good to put that disclaimer out there that that's what you're building towards right yeah that's the only way i'll play like i'm not playing somebody in an epic game that's just 300 points because to me that's not epic that's just 300 points like hey have a bajillion you know uh, x wings and headhunters and stuff or just go with a whole crap ton of y wings and tlts oh, like it's just the fun. worst <laughs> all right so like, i thought about like, how is how is that even remotely fun like let's just you yeah. know go outside and roll dice against the against the brick wall and see who wins at that point because it's you know it's, to me there's no real strategy involved in just gaming the system at 300 points versus 100 points so me i i built lists thematically i went with like just kind of with a cinematic mode if i'm going to play an epic game that's not dickish you know, that's not just a bunch of people doing like what you said. Oh, I maxed out on TLT Y wings. Wah, wah, wah. You know, don't do that, guys. Please don't do so, that. Yes. So basically, if if my other opponent's going to be bringing a fun epic list, and I'm going to bring a fun yet effective epic list. So most of mine, I think my cheapest, I built three. One with each of the the mod the modifications. One the cheapest is 54 points, and the highest is 62 points. And um. There's there's one of the ordinance tubes I did. Um, I I like your stress mechanic though. I really like that. I know the slicer tool is super expensive, um, but I think you can build your list around it, and it's going to be pretty cool. Um, I built one that was just uh, ordinance tubes, um, ordinance experts, homing missiles, and then I put um, IG eighty eight D because you're going to hopefully be pounding one ship and getting the shield back. You've only got four shield, but being able to just kill a ship, maybe a ship a turn, you know, that's going to help get shields back. So with that idea. And then um, WED-15 Repair Droid, who spends energy to repair regular hits and criticals, because you're going to have the energy, and you might be taking some hits, you know, throw that on there. And then I had cluster bombs as well, and that guy came out to be 57 points. He's very cheap. He's not maximized. He doesn't even have weapons engineer, but just the idea that he throws homing missiles at people and tries to blow them up. 
and the rest of the list is going to have to protect him more. Okay. That was my orcs <clears throat> build. That's a that's that's a cool little ship. Um, so, I like the stress mechanic that that yeah. Jbot said though. It is I like that. Yeah, the stress what, combined with the, the slicer tools. But that's not my main ones. I just wanted to throw that concept out there. But okay. uh, <laughs> what what modification did you go for, Phil? <clears throat> um, spoiler alert: I I don't actually have a modification on my ship. What? Dun dun dun! I don't what think you're allowed to be? do that. <laughs> What'd you do? All right, so I have a really just pared down. Um, you went cheap. I, I went cheap because I, I I kind of think that's what you should really be doing with these. It's it's very very dangerous to overload these. Uh, having a modification on there probably wouldn't hurt it too much in the end. But here's what I have. Uh, I've got a heavy laser turret, which is the uh, gun that comes with the ship. It's like a yep. It's range two to three, four dice, cost two energy to shoot. Um, it's a turret, so you shoot outside of your firing arc. Um, and it's five points. So it, I think that's a, a really good deal. Um, it's very flexible. You don't need um, you don't need to spend an action to set it up. Uh, you can shoot anything that's not at range one. It's four dice, so it's a solid shot. There's no uh, it's people aren't going to be doubling their dice against you. Um, it's it's a pretty solid attack. Uh, then for the crew, I have uh, Zuckus and Dengar. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Zuckus is kind of a no-brainer, I feel for for epic ships, just because you don't get the downside from Zuckus. So he's one point to have the enemy reroll all their defense dice. Uh, yeah, no, no cost to you. So, yeah, he he feels like a no-brainer on a ship like this, or, yeah, yeah, or really in in a lot of well, I guess some epic. Yeah, yeah. If you have a gun on the ship, you should have Zuckus. No downside. Yeah, yeah. To Zuckus. One point. <laughs> uh, then I I also have Dengar. Uh, Dengar is there for uh, the rerolls, obviously. Um, yeah. And he is also partly there to free up the action, so I don't need to be spending my target lock action. My, you know, you only get one action with this ship, so I didn't want that to be... I wanted to have a uh, dice modification without spending uh, my action. Uh, then the only other upgrade that I have on the ship is actually Commons Booster. Uh, Commons Booster is a cargo upgrade, and it lets you spend one energy to remove all stress tokens from a friendly ship at range one to three, then assign one focus to that ship. I, I like that because it's just a super straightforward and useful uh, support uh, ability. So with comms booster, you can have, uh, you know, push the limit ships out there that you're not only removing the stress from the push limit, but you're also uh, giving them another token on top of whatever they did. Or you could have ships that were doing Koi Grand turns, red maneuvers, uh, whatever. It's just, you know, it's a lot of utility for four points. And uh, I'll probably have enough energy to be using it uh, most turns because the heavy laser turret is going to take up two energy to turn or a turn to shoot. Uh, Thomas Booster is going to take one energy. Uh, so as long as I'm getting three energy per turn, uh, I should be good on my energy budgeting. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Um, I thought about taking a modification. I thought about taking optimized generators, which is once per round when you assign energy to an equipped upgrade card, gain two energy. That's five points. Um, I just didn't feel like I needed the uh, extra energy as much as I would need the five points somewhere else in the list. You know, I actually built a very similar list, and I used optimized generators, and I think it's going to be worth it because you, no matter how, let's see, sometimes you got to go fast, and you know, you put as long as you put your two energy to shoot your main gun, you still got two energy for for shields or something else, and I think I think that's worth it. I I actually I booked the trend that I didn't put Zuckus on just because I wanted to not put Zuckus on something. Um, 
and I went with optimized generators, the heavy laser turret, um, and Dengar because you've got so many actions that you could do. You could do the jam, the reinforce, the replenish. You know, you've got so many things you you need to be doing besides target locking. The Dengar's there to help give you those re rolls because you don't have the homing missile to do it. Um, so I went with Dengar and optimized generators, and I also went with a gunnery team just because just then, just in case. You want to spend one of your energy to turn one of your blanks. Let's say you Dengar roll and you still crap out some of your dice. Boom, you, you've got the extra energy there. You can spend the energy to to turn that to be more effective. And I thought the gunnery team for four points was worth it. Um, but I also put out WED 15 repair droid because you're going to have spare energy sitting there because you're going to be putting two energy every round on the gun. You're going to need to, you know, you're going to have the spare energy. You can remove some of the damage if they, when they do blast through you. Because he actually removes damage cards. And they can remove crits. And so I like WD. I like Construction Droid and WD Repair Bot. But um, I, uh, I thought in this particular list, with the spare energy every round from Optimized, you have those options. And if I wanted to really do Zuckus, you know, to really nail it, I could take the title and throw Zuckus on for three more points. And this is my lowest cost in ship here, 54. So that would knock it up to 57 points, which is really not that expensive. So to put it into context, mine is only 48 points. Yeah, I was about to say, how much How much did yours cost? So, so mine yeah. is, is, is pretty cheap. Yours is really cheap. You've got a lot more points in your list for, for non-epic stuff. Um, I, I, I wanted to make it a little bit better. I thought spending you know, a few more points to, for some repairability and extra efficiency in the actual attacks was worth yeah. it. So It's just that the danger of getting focused down is very, very real with these types of ships. That's what I always yeah. feel like. Yeah. I well, play yeah, the I mean, this ship has essentially fewer hit points and hit points as a total than some of the existing large base decimator ships there. Yeah. yeah which is uh frightening really when you think about it as a, as a epic level ship it, it seems kind of unfair yeah yeah, yeah. i i, I kind of I, I agree with you i think the epic ships should have more um hull and shield generally speaking it, it would be in a sense the easiest way for them to make epic ships feel epic by and I don't know that this yeah. is sort of the answer, but doubling the hit points and shields on most of this stuff, it'd just be hard to get through that much shield. But maybe just a lot more hull and and have the shields be not as not as strong. Um, I agree yeah, that it just, made, if they made them harder to kill, it would make them more epic. Yeah, I mean the crits should be um, the crits are painful uh, in the thing. So for me, um, I know they have you, you need a damage card for every for every hull point available on the ship. But it's it's like some of those crits, by the time, you, if you got through, you know, half of those crits, there's really not much ship left. It's just kind of maneuvering around. There's You've lost all your upgrades. You've, you know, yeah. you've really kind of screwed at that point. Yeah. yeah, well, let me let me go ahead and throw my last one out there. My favorite one was the, the one right there with Dengar and, and Optimized Generators. But uh, I had to build one with uh, Asmorrigan. So I actually said it right. But, yeah, I was uh, waiting for somebody to build one with the the uh, much maligned character. From, uh, <laughs> our last discussion. Yeah, so I liked him, so I wanted one. So I, I after all one. that talk, I'm like, where where's this guy at? Right, I, I put him on this one because I do like him. I do think it's decent. Automated protocols, huge ship only. Once per round, after you perform an action that is not a recover or reinforce, you may spend one energy to perform a free recover or reinforce. So that one will have the ability to throw out, you know, the reinforce and do other things or throw out the, you know, the replenish. But um, I went with as Morgan and I went with the merchant one title to get all the different teams targeting coordinator, weapons engineer and sensor team. I went with that because I like that. I think it's a good combo so you can get out there and throw out the target locks to the Y wings nearby, you know, then switch those teams out later on. And I went with uh, Tabana Gas and Heavy Laser Turret. So, you know, the Tabana Gas, you'll need it later when you get hit. But um, this is a ship that's meant to kind of stay alive, to be uh, you know, the Swiss Army Knife with the swapping out the different people. It's meant to do more than just kind of be a cheap thing, not to just be destroyed. So he's got 
as Morgan and stuff to dish out, and he can swap out for almost anything. And that's why I went for this guy. And I think this ship, it's 62 points. Oh, it's got the heavy laser turret. I'm not sure if I mentioned that. But it's 62 points, but I think it's got a lot of different options and tools that you can kind of configure and do stuff with. And you can keep it alive, and you can do crazy maneuvers. You can throw a Greedo if it works, you know, all that stuff we talked about. And I think this is a decently pointed tool that would work. Cool. Um, do you think that's the most flexible you could make it uh, before... Um you know, not taking as Morgan into account or, you know, planning planning to have as Morgan switching out stuff. Um, I feel like you would uh, want to make sure that you have the existing hardware on your ship uh, flexible in terms of it working with everything else that you might want to swap in. Does that make sense? Yeah, so I started off with a four-point crew and a three-point crew. Yeah, yeah. So I started off with some nicely priced crew. I've got the Tabana gas if I need the energy for something on later on, you know, because there's some things you need. Like if I need to swap to remove a critical, I can swap to WED repair droid and do the Tabana gas and burn off those crits and hits, you know, as actions. Or I can, you know, for whatever reason, or if I need to do the shield replenish really badly, or I've got I've got the tools with the with the two most two, the four and a three. Because there's no other real fours that you need besides the targeting coordinator. So I could downgrade some of those without too much of a penalty. Like if I needed to downgrade, like I could keep weapon engineer at the three and swap it down to a two. Or keep that as a three and drop to four down to the two. You know, it's it's got the options there to just to start switching around for various people. And the teams can swap out for um, engineering, if I need more energy or uh, um, weapons, weapons team, if I need to, be, you know, targeting team. So I think this is that that ship that we talked about in the last episode at 62 points is not too expensive, and he can do all sorts of crazy stuff. You're only limited by your own imagination. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> it, I, I mean, I, I like the ship. It's got so many things that it that it has as an option. I, it just concerns me that it's going to see even less play than almost every epic that's out there. Because, oh, you can't play it according to FFG in a normal game, even though it's priced cheaper than some of the ships that exist out there for a normal game. And then um, there's not enough kind of scum support to put with it. As in, there's no other epic ship to get it into that 130 point band. Um, and as soon as you say, oh, you don't need 130 points, no one's going to even bother taking this thing. They're going to take well, okay, okay. You know, 60 points worth of other ships that they can be nasty but I with. Think, but I think that's a temporary thing until they come out with the bigger scum ship. I think every, every faction is going to get the small epic and the large epic. And this is just the first one they've got out until the bigger one comes. It's just a matter of time, you know, until the other epic ship comes. I think also a lot of people don't think enough about cinematic play. In other words, like one person makes a bunch of lists or builds a crazy scenario or you just throw some cool sh stuff on the table you know and play what looks like a fun game like I, the thing that gets me is there's a lot of people that are like oh i really wish it was epic tournaments epic tournaments we need more support for epic and i'm kind of like i don't want to do an epic tournament because that's just more points to pull out the broken toys like i don't want the tournament concept it's like play games that are more about having fun than about freaking winning the prize epic metagames uh from what I've seen, can become so crazy uh, and so gimmicky because you the combos you just have so much more room for combos. Yeah, and you and have just... so much more room to pile on the super efficient stuff like the so you get you know lists like super bigs, uh, yeah, which is fun but it's completely it's based around a gimmick. It's it's a stupid gimmicky list. You've got more points to play with all the it's broken toys. It's a smart toys. gimmicky list, I would say, but it's yeah. still gimmicky. Well, it's uh, a it's a cheesy little list. Beardy is the Warhammer people would say, but yeah, Beardy is a good name for it. Just just um just play games. <laughs> don't don't play a game that's meant to be broken. Don't pull out the super combo. Like just like it doesn't have to be stuck on like with the official. FFG, 300 points for... Just just make stuff up that's fun and play each other. Is that really... I mean, if you're going to take the time to play an epic game and you pull out all the dang little toys, do you want it to be over in 30 minutes? 
Like, yeah, or oh, man, just just play some fun games. Like, it's, you don't want to you don't want to play TLTs versus TLTs Y wings for an hour. Right. Probably not. I mean, right. Does it really, uh, just have some fun, smart games. Make general agreements. Have one person make two lists. Something. Just like that to me is more fun. If you're going to play Epic, do that. Don't don't just build a beat stick to beat down the other opponent with some little some giant combo. I should say. It's just don't have. Don't have Captain Jonas flying beside your raider as it launches out all these weapons and getting all these rerolls. It's just don't have, you know, the Hawk Janors boosting the the main attack of the CR90 all the time. Just don't do these stupid things. Don't have Bigs out there where you can protect it and have the epic ship use its shields to protect Bigs and reinforce it every round. Just just don't do Bigs with like five tokens and four agility or something. Like yeah. <laughs> just, don't. just don't do it. I don't know, you know, play scenarios. That's what I always say. Yeah. Play good scenarios. Just play fun games, make up some yeah, stuff. Yeah, not scenarios play like Mario Kart. 3. Yeah. Yeah, don't play Dark Whispers. I don't recommend. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do an epic scenario. version of Dark Whispers. <laughs> <laughs> that actually might be interesting, at least, to have the epic yeah. version stuff, just to try it. Yeah, but you have to land on it with an epic ship. As your answer. <laughs> that would be funny. <laughs> I'm that, touching the board edge. That'd yeah. be crazy. Or, you know, like, and this is uh, something that we're going to be doing at uh, Gen Con. Like, another reason to attend Gen Con uh, is playing, I think, an epic game with just epic ships. Doesn't that yeah. sound fun? Yeah. Doesn't that's, that sound I'm, awesome? I'm all in for that one. Um, get, like, two or three epic ships on the table and just have, like, a big epic ship brawl with each other. And it's like Armada. Yeah. But different. Yeah. But X-Wing, so it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> not that I'm saying Armada's not fun, but, um, yeah, I haven't played it. All right, all right. So I know we've run a bit long. I thought we were going to be a little short this episode. Uh, it never happens. <laughs> yeah. That's not how it works. So, so that's what we got, uh, uh, our short one-hour episode here. <laughs> Dark Whispers is done. <laughs> we're pulling up into Endor space here. So I hope everybody has a good Sunday morning, even though for you it's Tuesday or Thursday. But um, anybody, any last parting shots? I think maybe Friday. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Any last uh, comments, Jbot? I just uh, we're we're slowly starting to get the YouTube page uh, up. So if you guys are interested in hearing some of the back issues again, um, they're there on YouTube. I'm also splitting up uh, very slowly um, the segments. So. I'm going to try and get the mission segments, rant segments. Uh, eventually, I think we'll get the captain's questions out there as its own segment as well. Yeah. Um, are you going to put ultimate... the in... – sorry, are you going to do the uh, point of no return campaign as a uh, series of episodes or like one super episode? Uh, we'll see. Um, it really uh, – I don't know how much people listen to the longer uh, longer form stuff, so people I like breaking the dramatic them. dramatic readings. They at least want <laughs> yeah. the dramatic readings broken dramatic up. Dramatic readings is just one episode would be cool. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'll have to. I have to see. Uh, it might just end up being individual videos, so people can play them before um, they're yeah, yeah. before they run it. But just put them in as a playlist on the YouTube page, so they yeah, just run yeah, back and back. Um, get all so, set. Get ready. to the commercial plays instead. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Hold on. Buy buy you know new car insurance from whatever. And uh, <laughs> like, oh, here's the reading. reading, reading, reading but, the Bluetooth speakers. They're like, yeah. <laughs> Geico, get out of here. From, <laughs> so. Uh, but yeah, just uh, feel free to uh, obviously. What's the what's the old term? Like, subscribe, blah 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 blah. Uh, but uh, it will be slowly getting updated um, as I can get to it. Um, there's, I'm suddenly getting thrust into a GM role um, for <laughs> uh, uh, for an RPG campaign. So um, who knows? That might show up on there as well. Um, yeah, we do have plans a, to put spin off one of these days. Yeah, we do have plans to put non uh podcast content on there as well um we're working on that and uh could be could be video long term um but it's probably just going to start out as audio at first um so yeah just check it out it's going to start growing a little bit and uh, hopefully we'll help the show um get even better that's that's well, really also, all i have also the idea of having citizen journalists if you guys have content whether it's recordings or video of like your own private games of your own hotak or uh you know missions or whatnot if you want to send them in to put them on our channel 
we uh, just contact uh, the the shuttle to dairy at gmail dot com about that. We can see about the you know possibility of doing that. We don't know how much. Yeah, spare it's time something that we're looking UAD. into right now with Biff, yeah. friend of the podcast, Biff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, hello. And looks like Jbot. Uh, we lost Jbot. Lost power. <laughs> He lost um, power. It took too long. <laughs> His batteries are down. All right. Uh, it's probably time to wrap up. <laughs> all right, guys. Thanks a lot, and tune in next week for the next episode of the Shuttle to Deering Podcast, the mothership of casual X-Men. Bye, guys. <laughs>